Um, so we have one last lightning talk before we take a break here. Um, and so uh, we will make it go like lightning, uh, lightning being exactly 15 minutes. So it's like lightning from the Sunday here or something like that. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce uh, Jalal Zifje and we wake Rama Vajil, Vaj, I'll, That's I, good I enough. practice this. <laughs> Rama, Rama Vajila. That's good, yeah. Okay. Um, who are from the uh, University of California, San Diego, and are going to be talking about finding culprits automatically in failing builds, i.e., who broke the build. Um, and I had an uh, opportunity to have dinner last night with Jalal, and it was a very fascinating discussion. So with that, I shall hand it over. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, hi, everybody. As uh, Tony mentioned, um, I'm coming from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, I'm a PhD student there, and I'm hopefully finishing in a month to join Google. Uh, and my colleague here, Vivek, uh, is already working at Google. And incidentally, he's also a graduate of uh, UC San Diego. Um, so our talk today is um, about finding culprits automatically in finding builds. Uh, in other words, who broke the build? Um, so let me first give you some background on how this project came to life. Um, so I was an intern uh, in the Google New York office last summer. And um, this started as basically a research project on uh, how to do this kind of job automatically. And we basically wanted to see if this is feasible, if there were any strategies that we could use to make this a reality. And uh, lucky for me, we actually found a good way to put this into production. And uh, right before I left, we started using it in uh, two projects. And we got some good uh, promising results, which um, I will give you some examples at the very end. All right, so let me first uh, describe what a culprit is. Um, so a culprit change list is, we define it as a CL that breaks the build. So as you uh, saw the, during the talks yesterday and today, um, most of the companies today, including Google, use continuous integration. And in a typical setup, um, you have a green build in which the build compiles, it, uh, all the tests pass, and everything is good, life is good. And then uh, developers commit change lists, and uh, those gray boxes represent change lists. And at some point in time, um, the continuous integration machines download the code, they build it, and some tests uh, fail. So we have a red build. So now what we need to do quickly is to figure out which of those gray boxes is the culprit. And it caused the, uh, the build to break. The reason we want to do this is because we want to have more green builds, which means um, we will have a, a better quality software. Because if we have a green build, we can have a, best, a faster development and release cycle, meaning we will be confident uh, with our build as long as it's green, so we can release new versions of it. And uh, also importantly, we are going to have fewer engineer hours wasted. So let me expand on that a little bit. Um, so when you have a setup like this, uh, typically, developers take shifts on uh, watching the build. Um, if the build fails, um, whoever is uh, watching it on that week or that month stops what he's doing, and then he starts investigating uh, what might have caused the breakage. Um, there are different ways of doing this, and I'm going to describe uh, different types of uh, uh, automation uh, on this problem um, and where we, where our solution lies. Um, but Pretty much, if you do this manually, then it's not a very good thing to do because you're going to waste a lot of uh, manual time of your developers. And uh, basically, we should have uh, an automated way to solve this problem. So let me talk about uh, how this can be automated or already automated uh, in different types of tests. So the first type of test is unit tests. Um, as you can imagine, these are pretty short tests. I'm talking about seconds here. And, um, if you have a problem like this, if the build fails in your unit tests, you can pretty much do the following. You can just build every single CL separately and possibly in parallel. And you can easily find the culprit in seconds or at the most minutes. Right? Um, if you have medium-sized tests, which take a bit longer than the unit tests, um, then uh, these are also more computation intensive. Then instead of building everything in parallel, because you don't want to use lots of computation resources, uh, you do a trade-off between time and computation, obviously, uh, which is common in computer science, as you know. Uh, so we can do a binary search instead. So what we can do is we can target the middle change list. We can build it. If it fails, then uh, the culprit is probably to the left. So we recurse to the left. If it passes, we go to the right. Uh, sorry, the vice versa. If it passes, then we go to the left. And we basically do a binary search recursively until we find the culprit CL. Now. Uh, 
these were already handled problems in Google when I came in. And the biggest problem lied on integration tests. So these are tests that take a very long time to run. And I put the eight minute cutoff uh, there, but uh, the ones that I looked at could take hours, let's say two hours, right? And basically the strategies that I described for unit tests and the medium sized tests obviously don't work for those uh, because every single build takes two hours. So then we have to have a different strategy to um, so automate this. And uh, as I said, when I came in, there was no easy way to find, uh, to find culprits like this automatically. So the solution was to manually investigate the change lists. All right, so basically our proposal was to have a completely automated tool that gives us suggestions about the culprit and do this for every single time that the build fails by itself and then uh, provide the user uh, some information about what it found and what could be the suspects. And the important things are here, um, it should be fast, uh, potentially it should give you a result within minutes. It should be cheap. Uh, it shouldn't use too many computing resources. As I mentioned, these can take two hours to run. And it should be good. Obviously, good is a subjective word. Uh, and I'm going to show you the results at the end, and you can judge for yourself. Um, all right, so this is the very high level uh, overview of how this works. So you, the tool monitors the build. If the build fails, it immediately starts looking at all the change lists that went into the build, and it ranks them. Um, so it calculates this metric that I call suspiciousness, and it, it then uh, puts the most suspicious ones on the top, and then it just basically sorts them reverse and tells the users that uh, here are the suspects that I think uh, are the culprits. Please take a look at them. All right, so obviously in this flow, as you can imagine, uh, the interesting part is how do we do the ranking, right? Um, so obviously for every single change list, we look at all the files in all of them. Um, and on a very high level, uh, I cannot give too many details, but I'm going to explain how we do this on a very high level. So we basically use two heuristics right now. The first one is, which is rather trivial, if a change list has more files than another change list, obviously it's more suspicious because it touched more stuff in the build tree. The second one is a bit more interesting. Um, it's distance. So if you think about a uh, if you think about a, a build tree, so it's basically a, a directed acyclic graph. And uh, basically, your library, uh, your project has lots of dependencies to other libraries. So um, if you think about this as a tree, um, there's a root of the tree. Let's say in Python, it's the core Python libraries, right? And um, the heuristic is, says the following. So if I depend on a library that directly uh, as my first uh, adjacent library, then it's more likely to break my build than a library that's up in the chain, that is closer to the root. This might seem a bit weird, but let me explain why uh, we thought about this. So think about a library that is closer to the root. Um, there are two important things that we observed about uh, such a situation. First of all, the libraries that are closer to the root uh, would be, if, if somebody makes a change in that library, they would be more cautious. For example, if you're changing the core Python library or something that immediately depends on it, obviously you know that lots of projects in Google depend on that. So you, you, you are more cautious on making changes and there's a more rigorous uh, review process and so on. And secondly, let's say you still made a mistake and you introduced a bug and you broke the build on that project. Then immediately, since there are lots of projects that depend on that because it's closer to the root, what will happen is some continuous uh, build, some continuous integration project other than yours will hit it immediately because lots of projects are running continuous integration and it's very likely that the first one that's already running with the new uh, changed uh, project will hit that bug and they will immediately realize this and figure it out and fix it. So this is basically the heuristic why we use the distance as a metric to calculate the suspiciousness. Uh, the important thing here is the heuristics are pluggable in this case, we used two, but uh, we had hopes on using other ones. For example, uh, if something fails, you can look at the logs. Hopefully, there are some keywords in the logs and in the diffs of the files that were changed, and maybe you can correlate them and so on. So we didn't implement that, but uh, what I want to say is these are pluggable. So you can combine these and uh, make your own heuristic and so on. Basically, it's a matter of uh, experimenting and finding what works for your project. And uh, with that, I give it to Vivek to 
to show you how this looks. So basically, after Chala left for his internship, I joined about the same week. So I only saw it working for the project that he was interning on. And uh, I thought it was a pretty cool thing because I had seen my teammates tear their hair out when they were finding out who broke the build. So I spent a couple of weeks hacking things together, a couple of months hacking things together and getting a prototype ready. So you just have to go to the, go to the UI and say, look, this is the build rule I have. And watch this thing for anything that breaks, anything that is indicating like a failed test in failure or anything like that. And the moment something breaks, go and figure out which is the latest green build, which is, which, is, which is the latest red build. Figure out which CLs between that are you know things like automated CLs, data updates, which are not really human errors. Remove all of those, do some pre-processing, and then actually get the culprits, and then send them to the team in charge of the project. And uh, I also end up implementing some of these smarter heuristics a bit. So things like, if you have logs, the logs will contain messages that say, you know, this is the place where an exception was raised, or this file didn't compile. So you can do a lot smarter things, like just figure out where this file was modified, and that gives you a lot more confidence in your scores. So since January or middle of January, we have about six or seven projects using this prototype. It's already been in this, uh, it, it already has investigated something like two to 250, 250 breakages. That's about 30 breakages per project in this two, three months. So that's pretty significant. And essentially, it, it, it lets you find the culprits in something like two to three minutes instead of half an hour to an hour. So you can just you know get back to your work instead of having to dig around other people's code. And uh, basically, that's it. So this was a prototype that I developed. And it's now being integrated into a proper production continuous build system. And that's a little slower, but it's getting there. So hopefully, if, once it's actually in place, it should be possible for people not to worry about you know, going through people's code, mailing them, asking them why you did this, and did you test it properly, and so on and so forth. And there are some results, basically, we often end up analyzing, because they're large integration tests, the number of changes we are talking about are in hundreds or thousands. So one example there is like the, the last one is the most significant, 17,000 CLs between the green and the red. And it's able to tell you that in your ranking, number seven is the answer. So that's, that's pretty significant. You don't have to worry about filtering out hundreds of CLs. And uh, hopefully, this is going to save a lot of time for people in the future, too. Yeah. And um, I want to finish by uh, reminding the three things that we wanted to have with this project. One, good results. And I think we can have some promising results here. Um, and second one is it should be fast. And uh, the first prototype that I implemented last summer took like six hours, uh, which was suboptimal, we can say. Uh, and then we uh, did some uh, runs on it, and uh, we did some optimizations. And then we took it down to, as he mentioned, like two minutes. Uh, uh, obviously, we use lots of caching and so on. And that's the third thing that I want to mention, resource efficiency. Uh, we basically don't go to the file system and you know query things. We, we, we use caching as much as we can. And that, that's why this is so fast. Yeah. So there's a lot of pre-computation. So we don't need to compute the build tree dynamically. Because once a CL is submitted, we pretty much know what the build tree was at that CL. So yeah. a lot of these things are pre-computed to save time. And um, the last thing I want to mention is I would like to uh, make a point on what Ari mentioned during his uh, keynote speech yesterday. Um, so he mentioned that Google is having starting to have some scalability problems in running all of the unit tests in all of Google. Um, and after we implemented this and saw that there are some promising results, uh, we had some discussions about uh, integrating this tool to the core technology infrastructure in Google. And the idea is basically if this tool can actually suggest the culprits or suspect, uh, suspect uh, CLs before, uh, after they are submitted, before they are built, then we can actually build all the CLs, even for unit tests. Instead of building all of them in parallel, we can actually build them in a certain order. For example, we can take the first 100 and then build them in parallel, basically the most suspicious ones. And then we can take the second batch and so on. So basically, um, the idea is if you see a CL that fails, then there's pretty much no point running the CLs after that, right? Because like after, uh, until that is fixed, they are going to fail as well. So basically, the idea is to integrate to, uh, to the core testing infrastructure so that we can have more efficiency in uh, testing at Google. And uh, that concludes our talk. Yeah. Just watch that clip. Great. Great. Thank you, Joel. Thanks, Vivek. Um, we can take a, a question um, on either aisle. I see some people lining up. So how about the left yeah. first? Although, Shadi, I don't think you get this. So. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Shadi. I work with the Chrome team. 
Uh, first, very nice tool, really nice work. Um, just wondering, how do you deal with false positives and what's the right way to update the heuristics that you uh, have based on the results? Um, I should say, um, I mean, we experimented with six projects so far. I mean, when I was here, we experimented with two projects, and now it's six. Um, I, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to do a formal evaluation, which I would like to do once I join Google in summer. Um, by formal evaluation, I mean literally going to a ground truth like baseline from all the unit tests that Google run already and uh, run this tool on them and see if I can actually identify that the ones that actually fail. So after we do that evaluation, I'm pretty sure we, we will have uh, a good uh, understanding of which experts, like which heuristics work better. Uh, but we basically like experimented with a couple of them, and these two look like the best ones. Uh, Speaking of uh, false positives, there also there also are other tools that identify flaky failures. So if a same test keeps failing in the same point again and again, and it's not really a failure, the user can notify the tool saying that look, this is not a true failure; it's a flake. So that basically can tell our tool that don't trigger on this failure. Wait for two, three more to happen before you think it's actually failing. Great. And with that, we've actually run out of time. Um, so thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, and we are, please.